Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Open Security Summit mini session in May 2021. And we are here today uh, with um, our Glasswall InfoSec team, the best team ever. <laughs> and we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about threat modeling, as always, which is our favorite topic. So we have with us uh, in the same room, which doesn't happen often. Yeah. We have in the same room, we have Chris Holman, which is our cybersecurity engineer. We have Dennis Cruz, our CTO slash CISO, and myself, which I am the cybersecurity engineer at Glasswall. And we're going to do um, a threat modeling session on one of our new and exciting products, which is the Glasswall Cloud SDK. Yeah. Cool. So I'll let um well I, I can say a few words about them um about the product and then uh, Dennis can take over. So basically what it does is um this product uses our magnificent magical core engine um to rebuild files uh and give the customer a clean file. And the way it does it, it um uses the ICAP infrastructure, which is one of our previous products that we've made in Kubernetes and connects it to a C-sharp API, um, which then the customer can use to call our core engine and to execute uh, the rebuild of a file. Um, one of the thing, one of the UIs that can be used with it is the file drop, um, for example, which is a React uh, app, or it can use our Glasswall desktop, um, or this can be also called programmatically through our C-sharp API. It is implemented in Kubernetes, um, it's quite easy to deploy because it has, and it has um, usually two clusters, um, and it interacts with our adaptation service to communicate with the core engine, um, and RabbitMQ is used as a queuing service, and it's accessible on the ports 8080. I'll let Dennis take over. I think you know some of this. <laughs> So, so one, one of the things that we really are trying to do here and also to show you know, again on the Open Security Summit and, 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 the, and the model that we're trying to promote here is uh, we now got to a level of maturity uh, at Glasswall where we have a, a really great security team. We have a very active you know, and development team. We're now working on, on mature platforms and mature environments. And what I'm, what I'm very keen is to really take this collaboration to the next level. So, we want, one of the things that we really want here is that threat model becomes not something that is done at a point in time, which let's be clear, it still is, right? Internally, or we, we're doing it, which is great, but I, I really want this to be more bottom up. So actually we got some of our devs here, right? I, I, I want this now to be part of how we operate as a team, right? I, I want, in a way, threat models um, are great briefing documents. You know, one, if one of the things that's interesting is that, and we, can, we should actually show a bit, is that the documents that we have that explains our security is one of the best documents that we have that explain how things work, right? And one of the tricks I've learned when I was to do a lot of security reviews, because um, let's be clear, right? When you do a security review, when the customer asks you, can you do this? Do you know this framework? The answer is always yes, of course, right? Then you go to Amazon and buy a couple of books, right, on it. Um, but I've learned that actually reading the security knowledge of, for example, a particular framework or how to break it, how to understand it, was always the best, how to, you know, you know, how to think about the particular framework or, you know, technology. I always found that was one of the best ways to understand technology. Because the security team tends to focus also a, a lot of how things work, not just the behavior, you know, and, and I, I lead both these moments, right? So I, I also see the pitfalls that is very easy in development to say, hey, that works, let's just use that, right? Whereas the security team asks the question, but how does it work? How does it connect the dots? What's going on here? What's the side effects, right? And, I, and I'm really keen, and, and, and these sessions that we were doing in like this one and next summit, et cetera, I really want to, to be almost as much a development session as a, a threat modeling session or a security session, because security is just an intended side effect, right? A lot of these things, it's just, you know, side effects that you go, well, if you connect that dot with that dot, then, you know, something else happens here, right? Yeah. So I, I feel that we're now in a very interesting point where we, we really want to go, you know, take the threat modeling to the next level and, and start getting the teams to, to do it. And, you know, and I'm here on the record saying that, you know, I, I'm giving my teams the time to create threat models, right? You know, 
you know, they have the time to document, they have the time, well, they should be using the time to document because I'm definitely not going to be the one that pushes back and say, can you deliver that feature before you document that? But the thing that we have to be aware of is that it's very hard to get developer teams to document stuff, right? And it, it doesn't help that we have this insane theory on the, on the DevOps team that say documentation is not needed because you, you know, you're doing stuff that DevOps did, right? You know, documentation is the code, right? Which is completely insane, yeah. right? So, so what, I, what I really want to see, you know, and I want to show again more examples as we mature and, and ideally the next Open Security Summit will also show you some good, more practical examples of this is how in a way the security team should be consuming the materials created by the developer teams not being used to create materials you know, for the development teams, which adds value, but has the problem that sometimes is not sustainable, right? Yeah. Which you experience already because, for example, we've done some diagrams that had great quality, but yeah. weren't fully maintained, Yeah. right? And when you look back at the architecture, you go, whoa, that changed, and that doesn't connect that anymore. Yeah. And, you know, and that's what happens in most organizations, right? Yeah. Most organizations say, show me the latest diagram. The good news is we just finished a bunch of presentations and a bunch of design, so we have this. But in most organizations, people go to the whiteboard and go like, well, this is how it really works, right? Yeah. Um, which is a bad sign, right? It, we're kind of nudging them to kind of update their diagram in a way to, um, you know, to reflect the current state, which... Yeah. But that's all part of the software development life cycle as well, isn't it? Yeah. That all plays into part of it. So if we can get in at that early stage, the, yeah. sooner, the, the sooner the better. Correct. But you need to think that you need to create a model that promotes that. Yeah. And one of the things that the security team has, which you guys need to leverage, we need to leverage, right, is the fact that you should be opening up a risk when the documentation is not up to date. Mm. There should be an item on the backlog that says, mm. this information is not up to date, yeah. which means there's a risk. Because it means that if there's a vulnerability or, or, or the new feature being developed, we're now acting on information that is not 100% correct. Yeah. You know, and the platform for that as well. Yeah. Not a good thing, so. and, and you rely on somebody to have that information in their head, yeah. which, you know, it might be that today they have, but what happens when you move on? Like, for example, we now get to the point where our, pla our CDR platform bits is actually getting quite mature. So basically that the development on that is going to slow down because we, it's getting feature complete, right? In a way, you know, what we want to make sure is the knowledge of how that works, the knowledge of how it operates remains so that anybody can come in and understand and work on it. So we don't depend on a couple of key individuals to understand it and to be able to write a fix for it. Exactly. So, so that's a risk that you can measure. Yeah. Right? Isn't that also the key in agile development? Like to have not have bottlenecks, which is like if you have only one person that knows um, the way the system works, that becomes a bottleneck. And then any subsequent change, if that person you know has 10 requests, they can't execute because it's always that one person Correct. that everyone goes to. So and you can measure that. So that's the interesting thing. The interesting thing is that what, what I realized was that. Security is a change machine, right? Like we are a factory of asking for change, right? And we very quickly, so you're now getting to the point, which is very interesting, that you're starting to hit the moment of, it's like a worldly map, right? You hit that attrition of change. Yeah. So in the beginning, it was, you, you, we were going very fast because there was lots of low hanging fruit. There was a lot of things that you can do and even you can do independently, but there's a moment that always happens that you're gonna hit the, the the place of attrition on documentation, on deployment, on, on maturity, on a particular product, yeah. where the reason why there's a pushback is not because they don't care about security, because they don't want to do it, is because you know what you require to do, sometimes it's very hard to do. The test framework is not there, the, the testing capability is not there. So you you find that you know the, the you're asking very good questions, but the answers take time and they don't scale. Yeah. Right? Yeah, true. Which is just a, implementing like uh, a new firewall can be um, quite a task if, if the process is not in place to make it a smooth transition. Absolutely. But you need to start capturing that as part of your threat model. See, part of your threat model is also the ecosystem. Yeah. Right? See, m m more and more in my head, a product is everything, right? A product is everything required to take that into a production state. Everything. And, you, and it's very easy to underestimate a lot of steps. It's very easy yeah. to say, hey, look, we can deploy this. We, we can deploy this version. We can make changes. We can make changes on the Helm charts. How cool is that? Like, we can customize all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, show me that change reflected in the production, right? 
and you find that there's lots of things that suddenly start to fall through the cracks. You start to see that if the team doesn't push to production every day, they're now going to be worried about it. And that means that their, their, their test framework is not good enough. Yeah. Right? And it's yeah. trying, I guess it's trying to define everything as well, isn't it? It's trying to make sure that you've got everything. When you say everything, it's, it's what, what is that? I guess yeah. and that's the hardest part, isn't it? Trying to define that whole picture, the whole scope. <laughs> and, and here's a really good spot, right? From a security team, the more you can align yourselves with things that add value, to the business and next to developers, the more airtime you're gonna have, yeah. right? So, so one of the things that I want you to do, because I can give you cover from both, both sides, is I sometimes feel that some of the battles to do something are really well fought from a security angle because you care about some of these things. Like for example, are you the team that if this thing gets exploited, has to be kept at one o'clock in the morning, right? And understand, where is it deployed, how it's going on, yeah, yeah. how does it fit together, and he's going to spend the next three days mapping things together. So in an interesting way, what I've learned is the security team, more than any other team, has a <coughs> lot of vested interest on maturity, Absolutely. on quality, yeah. on Absolutely. testing, on logging, on stuff, because they're the ones who pick up the pieces, right, when shit hits the fan, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and and I think that's a very important to, to think that then, you know, you want good documentation, right? So if you align yourself with that, then the, the, the dev team becomes, they, you know, they view you as an ally. Yeah. They go like, oh, this is not just a team they're gonna get me to do things that I don't wanna do because I wanna work on that feature or you know, stuff. They're gonna say, oh, this is the team that is gonna give me more visibility and actually allows me maybe not to create that documentation, maybe just like go and code this feature, right? Yeah. Or allows me when I code that feature, I get a much better understanding <laughs> What's of, of, of the side effects. Yeah. yeah. So that's okay. what you guys should be buying. So if you go to this diagram, this diagram here, and I think I can do annotations, right? Um, this diagram shows our application, right? And, and, and this is where I think it's also interesting, you know, for example, as a security team, for you to understand the business um, decisions that happen here, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I will also say like, as a security team, one of the advantages you have is that you can speak to everybody, right? Now, I'm going to say again, right? You can speak to everybody in a way that very few other teams or individuals can do, yeah. right? Because you can keep asking questions, right? You, and there's and any, anybody who doesn't want to answer, you can escalate that. Because you can say, look, I'm asking these questions. You don't want to answer. I don't have the time. You escalate up, right? You escalate it up. And then... The higher you escalate, the more ridiculous it looks. Why that question well, is not being answered, right? Yeah. So one of the things that you have to also understand is, is the business decisions of why something happens, right? So, so I always find that one of my biggest advantages when I started the security assessments, right, is I was a developer. I started as a developer. So I gain an instinct. And again, I kept myself busy in development. I gain an instinct for what's easy, for what's hard, for the fact that things don't just happen, right? <laughs> Secrets don't just appear, yeah. right? Data just doesn't get validated because you think it does, right? Yeah. So security is interesting because you can measure it, right? Like there's a lot of security properties, right? That you have that you, you need to start thinking. So, so one of the things that's interesting is that when you, when you look at this, it's important to start to think about, for example, what, what are the, the threads, which of course is what thread model, but also, what are almost some of the business patterns that you have here, right? So, so one of the things that you have here is if I draw a line here, so the way we think about this today is that this line here is what we call, oh, cool, see, is what we call the almost the CDR platform, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and, and this is now important because what I just draw there was the, the a thread boundary, right? Yeah. And, and one of the things that's very important when you do security here is that you need to think of this as a layers of abstraction, right? And I sometimes feel that the problem with threat models is that you're mixing abstractions all the time, right? And, and that means that your threat model gets A, very complex, B, becomes not very useful yeah. because you're not looking at the right things at yeah. the right level or, or sometimes, you know, somebody told me like, it's very important to think in terms of altitude. Right, like, are you looking at it from the right altitude or the right level of magnification, right? 
So in a way, the higher you go, the bigger the things bigger the bigger. look like, but you still see the big step. And as you go down, you know, you get finer detail, but you get a lot more, right? So that's yeah. why it's important to understand what level of altitude are you looking at this, which is why I really like this idea of doing threat models per layer and per use case yeah. or per vulnerability, right? There's nothing yeah. wrong with, with finding a vulnerability. So my party trick when I used to do threat models was to basically say, I want to do a code review before, right? I want to look at the code, just let me take a look at it. I would find a bunch of vulnerabilities or find a bunch of things that either work really well and they have to be a reason for, or things that I, I know that you know were not very good. Yeah. And then I would almost social engineer the thread model to find those things. Mm -hmm. So I would almost like walk the developers to go, look, you know, we do this, we do that. And when they said, we, we do that, I go, well, actually, <laughs> you don't, right? It doesn't do that, right? But, but it's very important to understand you know, the, the multiple layers here. So one of the things that's very important here is that if you look at, for example, this architecture, you already have two very distinct layers here. Oops, sorry. So you've got, sorry, that guy actually is supposed to be there, right? So just like, you know, no, it doesn't go in, right? Forget it, no, so this is my drop, that's not there, right? So, um, so you've got the green layer, right? Which is basically what we actually call in the CDR platform. Mm -hmm. and, and that has, in principle, it has uh, two input points, two output points. Right, yeah. you know, which is basically the the file in and the queue in, and the queue out and the file out. Right. Yeah. Those are the input points. Right. And that's very important because you start to map out like wh where does that attack surface go? Right. Like so. So any attack in here. Right. Oh, you can't see my mouse. Sorry. Um, any attack, you know, in this area, there, there, right inside that blob, you know, which, which is green. So. Um, purple, right? Inside this, the green circle, the, the threat apps are very different. Mm -hmm. Not to say that we, we don't protect things, but it's important to put things into context. It's always, in, and that's why sometimes I know I drive you guys a little bit crazy when I ask why, why does it matter? Yeah. Who's the attacker? What's oh, the use case? <laughs> because, you know, let, let's be clear, right? Like data in transit here inside the green space and encrypted, it's it's not a major deal. It's yeah. important, yeah. but unless you're worried about somebody compromising AWS, mm -hmm. right? Or compromising Azure or compromising your um, you know, Kubernetes cluster, yeah. you know, like they not they can't well, do a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you need to say, well, if they're already there, they can do a lot worse, right? But however, so having said that, sometimes that can happen. Like if you're deployed in a customer's premises mm -hmm. and a customer has an AWS account compromised. Because their system admin is like overwhelmed with work and sure. you know has a lot of stuff to do, and is the only person doing it, our product can be as much as insecure as we want. But like, if someone compromises their AWS account, yeah, that's also... but that's a risk you highlighted. Though. That's something you, you... yeah, yeah. And yeah. That's 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 I, I, yeah. I, to be fair, I, I, I think that, and, and this product is interesting because mm -hmm. I want to look at that element of this product, which is how does the product sustain an attack? In fact, an interesting question is. If this was solar winds, right? Yeah. Like we were compromised, what's the side effect? Because I think it's important that we have that level of maturity. It's important that we're the first ones to say, look, if there's a vulnerability in our product, if there's a compromise in our supply chain, right? If something happens here, what is the side effect? Yeah. Now, in solar winds, or at least in some solar wind deployment, it's like you completely own, right? Like fucking these guys will own everything, yeah. you know, in the kitchen sink. Where there's an argument to be said that if somebody they had protected that solar winds, if they said why should this environment go to the internet? Suddenly, even although that had been compromised, there's a backdoor in there, you couldn't go out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why now this green thing is important because I would argue that, for example, like we were privileged to work with some, you know, high, let's call security conscious customers, right? Who basically from the day one said this has to work offline, which I really like because it forced us the discipline to exactly. basically make right. sure that none of these works needed the internet to work, yeah. right? And it's very easy. As you've seen, to design something that suddenly, you know, even minor things, right? Like even sometimes it's a simple UI or something little minor, or maybe a route in queue that has to do a health check and that doesn't go. Then you go, well, it needs access to the internet, and then yeah. suddenly you create a massive right, vulnerability because yeah. of that. So, so one of the views that you should have here, it's a view that just puts almost like that whole green thing as almost like the box, and then just say, what is the threat of that? Right, because that's when you start to understand 
what are the like the, the, the vulnerabilities by the fault that you have with that, what's the risks, but also what's the defense that you've got? Because in a way, it's only going to get worse. Well, sorry, sorry, you can only get better, right? From there, in, term, in principle, right? Because you found that the place of maximum vulnerability, right? And, and what I want is I want a case where whenever, for example, and this is, this is actually very important. It's actually important even for the devs on the room here, right? It's very important that as we make changes to architecture, right? There has to be a point where you go, oh, hold on, that cannot go into production. Oh, hold on, that design doesn't go in there, right? Because one of the biggest things that you need to think about is that in a CI pipeline, which we do have here, it's impossible to do a security review on every single commit, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. we only have N security people for yeah, five yeah. N developers, right? Yeah, yeah. So yes, we get some development to do the work, we do some static analysis, but the bottom line is they're gonna be, you need the need to push to production or push at least to dev or you know, pre-prod or at least to a certain mm -hmm. pipeline in a way that the security checks in our bottom end. Yeah. So the question then becomes, when do you put a bottom end? Because I'm not saying that every commit should do that. Yeah. What I'm saying is that we need some commits that should have a, a fast line and some commits should not have that. So, okay, so again, as it comes down to like, where is the commit in the attack space? It's like, for example, if it's one of these services that's inside and we think that you know these services are not going to be connected to the internet, we don't need to pay that much attention to these commits. Yes. But like, if we're going to push a commit to the code um, of the C-sharp REST API, then we need to think about possibly doing a security I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. So a very good example is if I gave you two options, you spend time reviewing a commit here, right? Or improving the patching level of one of these guys. Yeah, I'm going to go for the C-sharp. Yeah, because now you have context. Yeah. But it's very easy yeah. to look to at Snake yeah. or you look at our latest you know, dashboard yeah. and see a pile of reds on you know, think, yeah. vulnerable <laughs> versions because that part has a, 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 you know, a vulnerable version of CURL yeah. or a bash or something that we don't even use, right? So, so again, context is crazy well, important. Context around every component as well. That's yes. the whole idea of mapping out yes. the product. Right? Absolutely, yeah. right? So, so what's really cool about this, right? Is that when you look at this architecture, and now let me just replay this, you know, because somebody wants to kind of get a sense of this, right? Can I actually, if I, who's, who's trying to say? Uh, where's the map? <laughs> oh, can you? Oh, well, how do I go? How do I, how do I move the map? <laughs> no, you can't move the map. Oh, here it is. Look, the beauties of actually being in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool is oh, that? No, we lost okay. Cool. Uh -huh. right. okay, now I'm seeing your. I was seeing that guy there. Wait, wait. Okay. Okay. Wait, okay. While, while, while we do the, while you fix the. Yeah, but you want to share the, I think your share screen is up, right? Yeah, one second. Let's take a video. Over here. Yeah, we don't want that camera. You just want to share your screen. Yeah. Cool. And you want the presentation. No, you want the. Uh, that's the one, right? That one. Cool. Right. All right. Now, mouse works. Cool. Right. There you go. Okay. Okay. It's all right. All right. Well, mine's the mouse, right? That's what I'm seeing here, right? So. Much easier. It's not working. Oh, wait. Is it working? That should be working. Can you find it? This guy works. Okay, just use it. Okay, cool. Right. So, so the way, the way, and, and that's why uh, I'll do the drawing here, right? Cool. All right. So, um, so if I go back into this, right? So, this is what we call the CDI platform, right? Uh, that bit there, right? So, so the pattern here is that you have the original store, which is where the file comes through. So, basically, this is a filing file out workflow where we basically have the original store that contains the file. And the pattern is that you put a file in the original store and you put a message in the queue, right? Yeah. So, so that's where now you start to see, okay, so now you need to think of this as what can this guy do from an attacker point of view? 
So you so what's really cool about when you have the, your your security boundaries yeah. is you start to see what can the layer up do to attack the system, right? And but this is this is very important because one of the things that sometimes we don't do very well is understand the inner vulnerabilities that we have in our particular microservice architecture yeah. that exists almost by default by design, right? I'll give you a good example. Like sometimes you tend to have a method in these services, say get account ID or get order, right? Now, if the only thing that web services receives is the order ID, well, that, that is a data disclosure vulnerability by design, right? Like by design, it leaks all the users, it leaks all the stuff and there's no authentication authorization checks. So what it's doing is, is pushing the requirement to validate whatever security requirements you want to do to the columns. But it's very important that we map this. It's very yeah, important yeah, that yeah. we understand at each layer, what's the worst case scenario that can happen because that starts to determine, right? Your, your, your exposure, your attack surface. Yeah. So, so for example, if you look at this scenario here, right? I would not expect, for example, from here for you to be able to manipulate any of the parts, for you to have internal access to some of these systems, for you to go to SSH into any of these things, but it could be possible, right? So we need to understand you know, what's the status. And actually it's important, for example, when you go to Kubernetes, yeah. you might find that it is possible, for example, for, for this guy, right? To connect directly to that one there, right? So it's important that when we, we look at the, the actual architecture and then you apply this to reality, you might say, well, although we might have an architecture like this, you know, if you don't configure the Kubernetes correctly, you might find that this guy could be hitting that guy, could be hitting that one, this guy could connect to that guy. So, so you then start asking the question if, you know, if one of these is malicious, right? What's the side effect of that, right? Yeah. And what's the impact as well? Exactly, right? But that, that's very important to ask those questions. So, so in this case, right, the, the scenario that we have to think about here, and this is where, there's a massive intersection between security and testing, right? Because one of the questions you want to ask is to the dev team, right? Which you can ask, right? Is where are the abuse cases from here to there, right? And these abuse cases are basically should exist are part of normal QA, right? right? Because they can represent a bug. They can represent actually an attack from here. Right, but you find that sometimes it's easier to trigger scenarios from the inner layer than from the outer layer. Yeah. Because you might find that, for example, when we look at the vulnerabilities from out here, right, versus the vulnerabilities from, you know, here, right? In a way, like when you look at the different types of vulnerabilities, i.e. from the outside world versus from, in this case, the REST API, they should be different, right? So it might be okay, to have a case to say we can't survive an attack from our REST API, right? But if that's the case, it means that your REST API now, in this case, has a lot of security responsibilities. Yeah. Where I would argue that in our design, we should be able to handle an attack from a malicious REST API. Because the only thing you should be able to do is add more things to the queue, which yeah, it means the server will take longer to process, but I wouldn't expect it to be able to crash the server. I would expect to be able to crash a pod. So that it should be impossible from, in this design, from the C-sharp API, oops, wrong pod, to, to basically to crash, right? Um, what's it called? This guy here, which is the pod. Yeah, no, it should be. Right? But, and, but this is also where- we have auto-scale as well. Yeah. Like if there's too much traffic, Yeah, but, it, but in this case, remember that the way the design works is the REST API is a pod, or actually a series of pods, more correctly, in the cluster. So in this particular scenario, where does the load balancer come in? Because we've got the load balancer on top of the WAC. Plan, sorry, WAC on top of the load balancer. Yeah. That would protect us somewhat against that scenario, wouldn't it? Well, so there's already, this is where, okay, yes. But so you have a load balancer here. Well, actually outside. So in fact, you, have, you might have that diagram actually uh, yeah. here. So, 
do you have that diagram? Yeah, so there you go. So if you look at this diagram, right, the, we were just looking at this part here, right? So that's what we were looking at, yeah. right? So in the final deployment, the load balance that hits here. Yeah. So, so this guy will have access to a number of, um, what's it called, of, of servers, right? But, but for example, like one of the things that we adding, it's already on the backlog, but I would argue that's needed here is at the moment, the cluster doesn't have a good way to say I'm under load. Is that what the load balance Yeah, but how does the load balancer know that? Sorry, Dennis, we can't hear Chris and Petra. So can, can Chris re like um, repeat his question again? Oh, one second. How come you can't hear? Well, you can hear we, we, can, we, we cannot hear Dennis properly. We can hardly hear both of you, Chris and Petra. Oh. I'm set, guys. I've got to sort of I can hear you, but it's just hardly. <laughs> well, maybe because the, the, the laptop, oh. Dennis' laptop is like right in front of the speaker. Is that, I don't the, know. Is that... Maybe he's, uh, Dennis sitting next to the mic, closer to the mic. Chris, no, is... the cable, where is the audio thing? Just say the question again. I think we can we, we can hear it. About the load balancer, like how does the load bar balancer come in into the whole system? And that's where Dennis was. Explaining. Where should it be? Like, right? Is that the question? Yeah, and how does it come in into distributing the load, like preventing like um from like a overload of the whole cluster? Can you can you hear Petra now? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, I think. Oh, well, I think we can. Okay, go share screen. But but you see that that's one of the you know. I have to say that one of the one of the things I remember, I think you 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 could share the presentation and then okay. match mine because I think you I'll tell you I'll tell you when you when you get go there, share that. And then if you just present in my should be fine. One, two, and five. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's good. So so what I, I actually remember that when I when I start doing threat models, right, and security reviews on cloud systems, right? I, I remember having you know a lot of very interesting conversations on the whole auto scaling. Because there was this kind of magical thing of it auto scales, yeah, exactly. right? But but exactly how does it auto scale? Yeah, right. Because that's very important. And also how fast does the auto scaling hit? Mm. Because if you have, for example, some of the auto scaling models is that it's based on the average of the last five minutes of the load. Right. So so they design for incremental changes to to traffic that's you know over a so period if, of time. Okay, so if you if you send out an attack that's quite a slow ongoing attack, then the you're going to get the auto scaling. Yeah. So you get protected, which represents the user. Yeah. But, but, if, but I'm thinking if you're sending in incremental traffic, yeah. still in a slower pace, yeah. but incrementally, yeah. the load balancer might not react because it will just get, make a decision based on the last five minutes, you said? Yeah, no, but the load, okay, the, the load balancer is usually tied up with auto scaling, right? So auto scaling means that. As the traffic goes in, you add more servers to the load balancer, yeah. right? So you, you might have five servers, right, with a load balancer, right? And then, you know, and then you monitor. So if you look at AWS, right, AWS has a mode where it monitors the health, mm -hmm. sorry, the, the, the CPU average of all the servers. And if that goes above a certain number, AWS adds some more. So now you have seven servers. So you can actually go to AWS and say, you can go, you, I want two, you know, but I, or five, but you can have a maximum of 20. Right, so so then AWS will basically add more servers to the auto scaling group, which is fronted by a load balancer. So from the outside world, it's still the same IP address. You just have more, right? The so it'd be a event of a DOS attack then, if that's continually adding new servers. How far can it go before it's enough? I mean, can it can yeah. it keep going up and up and up? Well, then it becomes a cost issue, right? Yeah, but that's why, from an attacking point of view. We, we, we don't have to play fair, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, basically, you know, we, we, there's going to be patterns. So this, again, depends on what type of attack you have, right? So, you know, we, we want to start to, in a way that depends on how the attacker is sending the request, we want to find ways to drop it. Or uh, in the past, we did this really cool thing where we redirect it to another server. Yeah. So we actually did this really cool thing where there was a number of, actually a number of servers that were actually used for, for web scrapers. So, so there was a problem of, this was an e-commerce website. They have a massive problem with spiders, which actually was a business requirement. So you can't, you go to the business and say, hey, there's all these spiders out there who are going to our website and grabbing all the prices and freaking, you know, you know, crashing our backend because they're like, 
keep doing all this massive traffic, right? And the business went great. We love it. Can we have more? In fact, that guy there was responsible for finding more, right? And you're going, uh, okay. So the solution was really cool was to detect those and redirect them to servers that, for example, did not connect to the back end. Yeah. So, so there were certain servers that, for example, you couldn't check out. You could do everything, but you couldn't check out. So there was, in, and then we found that those, those servers were really cool to send the attackers to <laughs> because even, even if they end up fighting a vulnerability, right? It wouldn't actually, you know, it was much more self contained, where they actually were running on almost a parallel infrastructure that was designed just to send data out. And it was okay if it was not even feature complete because you're dealing with spiders or attackers. But, but your, your point there in terms of auto scaling is technically you should be able to scale a lot, especially with the cloud. It becomes a question of cost, but also becomes a question of it's very hard to generate lots of traffic that doesn't have a pattern. And if it was a pattern, would it be detected by the web? Well, the, the, yeah, well, yes and no, right? You have to be careful right. because it depends on how they did it, right? But, but having a lock in front or having some technology that we can monitor mm -hmm. and we can have a feedback loop allow us yeah. to do that. Yeah. And one of the things I like about the AWS WAF, and there's other WAFs who have some functionality, but what I like the most is that you can wire it to a Lambda function. So what it means, it means that you can start to add a lot of intelligence to it, which basically means that, for example, like you might not be able to pick up the attacker on the first and second request or the fifth request, but you can start to have, for example, some asynchronous checks that then go and say, ooh, I now think that guy's malicious. I now think that that track is malicious. So you can start to drop cookies on it. You can, you can do, there's all sorts of little things that you can start to do to start to fingerprint first is in the attacker, then you can decide what to do with it. So you can start to mass block IPs, right? But you want to do it in an automated so way. That almost turns into a prevention. Yeah, exactly. So Absolutely. Yeah. Idea yeah. slash IPS. Yeah. Absolutely, right? And but that's what we want to add to this, well, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So we want to add self-defense mechanisms because also remember that this could also be crashed, right? By a very aggressive. For example, we now have another product which we're going to look later this afternoon, which is called the folder to folder, right? Yeah. And that one technically can overload this. Right, so technically that server, that service can actually do this. So, so going back to the point I was making here, that at the moment, like in, this is where in security you have to follow the question because nothing always happens magically, right? Like you know things don't just happen. So if you have a load balancer here, right, and there's a load balancer, oops, sorry, can I? Can it, works, it works. Hey, cool. Uh, uh, where, where is it? Got it, right. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Uh, lagging, okay, all right. So if you have a load balancer here, right there, right, how does it know, right, that, you know, how many, first, how many servers there are and if the servers are healthy? So in the security, you, you, you should always be curious. You, you should never take because for an answer, yeah, right? Okay. And if somebody doesn't answer it, you open a risk yeah. or a vulnerability, right? And it can be, you know, nobody understands this. I don't know this question, right? And that's why I really like this evolution that you start to do now, that we, we can evolve where the Jira ticket can evolve from a question to a fact, to a vulnerability, right? It's almost like you can start something very, how does it work, right? If nobody knows the answer, you can basically turn from that to a freaking vulnerability. It's like, we don't know how it works, right? Or nobody knows how it works, right? And eventually, blah, blah, blah. So, so the way it usually works here is that the load balancer will send an HTTP request that you can configure to here, right? To say, are you okay, right? And then he expects to receive, for example, a 200 back. So if he receives a 200 back, the load balancer says, cool, I can send traffic to it. If he receives a 500 or something else, then you can configure some of the behaviors. But, but even then you have to go, okay, but who's saying, it, right? You have to keep digging. Right? And this is where you need a threat model just for this, oh, yeah. because yeah. this has implications, it's right? Specific use case yeah. Really. So the implication here is, is how do you scale the threat model? How do you scale the actual functionality? So in this case, in this first implementation, that is actually a help of the Kubernetes cluster. So it's actually the Kubernetes cluster that will say, I'm okay. But what we actually want is the application to say it's okay. So you actually need the next version of the pod that we're working on, which is a pod that actually knows how to go and get a certain amount of metrics. For example, to say how many rebuild pods we have, 
how many free memory we have. Are we able to receive new more requests or do we need some time, right, to, to, to slow down a bit? So we, so basically it's almost like send traffic to somebody else. Right, and because then you eventually hit the capacity of the system. There's no point of having servers in this case who are massively overloaded, and and then you have a problem that the more you send to them, right, yeah. um, the more they, they build up. Because the problem with this queue, right, is that, and this is where you need to kind of have a big experience on this, is that if one of the servers slows down and you distribute it in round robin, right, which is basically one at a time, it means that once server three slows down is still going to get more requests. So that means their queue is still going to be bigger, which basically means that that server might now be in, a, in an unstable state for you know, lots of minutes or hours, depends on the traffic. Because, and it's very, and that's a problem because although you might have traffic next door that can totally handle, so you can end up having some servers that become unstable one at a time because they get overloaded. And then depending on the traffic, you can never come back, right? So one of the really cool exploits I did once was that we found a way to fingerprint the servers and the load balance. So we found a way, and this was an interesting, well, capability was a, a, actually, you can argue it's a bug, was where, where that the, the application did not support multiple servers, you know, handling the same session, right? right? So, that, so they had to do a design where they had to add a cookie, I think, or a, a special header to the request so that the next request will hit their load balancer, which, is, which meant that when the particular value was set, would not allocate it at random, will send it to a specific server, right. right? Now, this is where then you need to do the threat model, okay? And then you ask the question, okay, how can I abuse that? So if I'm an attacker, right? If I now can control which server I'm hitting, right? What can I do with that, right? And then what we found was that we can then overload one server, right? Because the traffic to bring down a server is much less than the traffic to bring down a cluster of 200, mm -hmm. right? And then we found that we can hit a couple of servers at a time. And then there was a very interesting calculation. I think it was like, once we hit 20% of the servers, the rest will start to fall down just on the peer traffic that was coming. Because remember that if you take 20% of the servers, now that 20% is going to be moved to every single other server, mm -hmm. right? And there's a number here that everything starts to slow down. And then if the application at the time was designed that the users kept pressing refresh, so you now have a weird situation where if the user didn't get the response within you know, five to 10 seconds, they'll hit refresh again, because they think, ooh, you yeah. know? So they would increase the amount of requests, yeah. right? All right, so, so here in this application, I would argue that as we lock down a lot of the things, which we have, one of the areas that we need to look at is exactly, right, what happens in that load balancing, element. And, and the, other, the other area that I feel we want to work on here is the fact that when I, sorry, if I draw the, um, what's it called, the attack surface, you actually have three very distinct attack surfaces here, right? Which is you have the attack surface from the outside in, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically uh, from here, right, to here, right? And that's literally what you have on the next slide, which is those endpoints. Mm -hmm. Then you have from here into these four stores, yeah. right? So you need to ask the question, what can that REST API do, right? If it's malicious, right? And that's a very important question when you look outwards, yeah. because that tells you that what's the worst case scenario from that side. And then you need to look at, in this case, what's the worst case scenario from this guy? here, Because in this architecture, this is the one that is actually doing the analysis. So, so if for our right reference, what we do is we take a file from here and actually here, 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 that file is just a binary string. Nobody's really looking yeah. at that file. It's only when it gets to the request processing part that we're handling it to our Glassful engine. Now it's almost like that's the moment that things get weaponized, right? That's the moment where you're almost like, you know, of highest danger. That's when you open the letter. That's when you open the document. So we also need to look at this from a thread modeling point of view to say if that guy is compromised, like if, and then there's multiple layers of this. You know, you know, okay, if you get remote code execution, but if you get, what about if there's a buffer overflow? What about if actually that bit up there actually becomes 
exploitable, right? What is the blast radius? And we want a situation where in this case, again, the impact should be minimal, yeah. right? Well, yeah. Which we have done because every file um, gets, you know, there's a file per part. Yeah. So um, that, that, that helps. <laughs> and, but that's a massive design paradigm that yeah. we've done on here. Yeah. Right, and, yeah. and this is where you, from a, at least from a security point of view, we should actually again be helping the business to yeah. say, hey, look, you know, these are the features of the product, right? Yeah. And, and our customers will, will be very happy because we then say, look, this is the, the threat landscape. This is where you have to be careful. So we could say, look, we, with this system is not designed to survive an attack from an AWS admin. Yeah. It's not designed to survive an attack from that entity. But for example, this architecture is already designed in a way that nobody should have access to internal of this. But that's important, right? It's important because it means that we don't expect people to SSH into this in normal system behavior, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but that means that, again, your attack surface gets reduced because suddenly, right, you know, because remember that there's going to be normal admins of this, but this system, for example, holds a lot of confidential data. Right, so so you can argue that the, the trust level of somebody in the system might need to be quite high, but for the team who runs this on a day-to-day -day basis, we almost want to trust them. So, so you actually want to say that the admins or the day-to-day -day admins on this are also potential malicious. Yeah. Because there might be some SOC team in the middle of nowhere, there might be some person over there, right? So so this is where yeah. So this is where you see, think about like even on this system. Is worthwhile doing another version of this that only has this individual bits, right? Because that's really how we should be looking at this. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so if you look at the next slide, right? Um, what's really cool is that what we can then start to look at is these scenarios. And one of the things that, and now there's a really good thing here, right? Which is this is already done using, I believe. Plan to ML, right? Or Mermaid, right? Or since, I think it's Plan yeah. to ML. Yeah, it's right? Plan to ML. Which, which I know that we've done some experiments on it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the problem is you try to build too much. Yeah, exactly. Right? When you try to model the whole system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When things are, when it's a complex architecture diagram, um, when there's a lot of services and a lot of moving parts, it becomes extremely buggy and it's all just throwing around components yeah. and it doesn't make sense. And that's when, it, what my, my, look, my thing on this is that you use tools when you have, um, like you use the best tools you can get. And as long as you keep having a certain degree of speed, you should continue to use them. As soon as you hit diminishing returns, you don't fight it. You need to be very brutal. Like, like you guys were, like it doesn't work, you throw it out, right? And you try something else. And, 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 and sometimes we have to develop our own, nothing wrong with that. Just understand that most likely we're gonna get rid of it once something else better comes along, right? But it's very important to be able to be very brutal with those systems and saying, look, if I hit points of diminishing returns, you know, I stop. But I think you guys actually almost did a thing where it's like you, you stop using it all, right? Where actually, you know, it, it, yes, you, what you found was that for that massive use case, it doesn't work. But for example, for this use case, you know, the developer team already gave you the patterns for a lot of the things. So you need to now take each of these and each of these needs to have its own threat model. Yeah, break it down to what A doesn't work. Right? Yeah. So you need to now understand, for example, what are the threats that each of these happens? And going back to the work that we need to do is that you need a template, you need a playbook yeah. that every time we add a new endpoint, right? You, um, you get an alert and then you say, answer these questions, map this out, et cetera. Right? And, and actually, can, you're sharing it, right? Yeah. Actually, let, let me share. You stop sharing, I'll, I'll share my screen. Um, but one, one of the things that, yeah, I think we're finishing up, but you know, again, this was, this was a first good pass, right? Hey, um, one, of, one of the things that you, for example, you, you as a security team, or we as a security team, sorry, uh, need to have is you need to know um, where where to look, right? And one of the, one of the one of the features that we added here, which are, for me is is, is actually uh, I'm very proud of this because I think it's a is one of the things that is very important 
for uh, a lot of products to have is, you know what I was saying that you need to know when to trigger certain reviews and, and some threat models and, and some analysis, right? So you need to know when the attack surface is changing, right? Yeah. So how do you know when a new endpoint is added to that thing? Alert. Yeah. And, and where should your alerts be focused on? Yeah, but you're going to look at all the code. No. So you're going to you're going to basically have one of you guys is going to have to PR review every single right pull request, every single commit. You could probably do like the workflow file that would get triggered. Yeah, or maybe what about something like this? This is your API. This is your API. Mm -hmm. This is your test. Yeah, yes. This. Code check, basically. No, 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 no. Right. This is part of our unit tests. Okay. This is part of the tests that we run, right? With every build, right? So if you look here, every build, right? For example, that one, right? Has, um, you know, runs a set of integration tests, right? That, um, that runs the tests, right? That runs, you know, basically that runs these tests, right? One of the tests that we have is literally this, right? Lock the crew and mapping so that new API changes also require change in this test. So every time this test change, this, this particular code change here, it means that this one of these APIs were added. Because if you add a new API yeah. to the code, right, that doesn't and you don't change it here, you break the build. Right. Yeah. <laughs> See, so this is a good example of one of the security, the, the test that actually should exist in, in, in actually, it could even exist on a section that is monitored by you. Yeah. So you, you can have a set of tests, which can actually call security tests. So this today is a test that is on the QA side, but actually I would argue this is more of a security test than uh, the simple QA, because this test locks in basically the whole structure, the gets, the posts, the puts, the parameters, and it can actually be evolved. So at the moment, you know, you know, eventually we will add authentication to this. We add all sorts of other things to this, right? And you can see here that if you look at the history of this, right, you'll see that, for example, right, look, there you go, right? Look, fix the broken test, right? That's what it was. We added a new endpoint, okay. right? And the endpoint, you know, is now here. So now you need to look at what is the security implications of that endpoint. So what, what, what should be, basically what we should have here is a way to have a threat model for that endpoint. Yeah. And, but what, what we want to do from a security point of view is already have a preset of created threat models. So you almost can choose which one does the new endpoint add, right? Yeah. And, then, and then you can say, well, this endpoint, you know, has the same risk profile as that one. Right, so you could say, well, the worst, like for example, this endpoint, the worst thing that can do is kind of maybe, you know, crash the bank, right? Um, and again, we still need to prove it, but you can argue, well, if you hit this very hard, you know, you might be reloading Kibana a lot of the times, and maybe, maybe it doesn't. Maybe we can say we can't crash Kibana, right? You know, actually, Kibana is already well designed, so that even if you start to make a thousand requests to just refresh the dashboard, it just handles it nicely, right? Or maybe it doesn't. So, so then. For each of these, you, you know, and this because remember that this is the attack surface of the application. So, so here's the interesting thing, right? Like if you look at your list of APIs, right? Already doesn't look like like this. Although actually, to be fair, sorry, this is the this is the folder to folder API, not the other one. Uh, okay. Sorry, that's why that's why they look a little bit different. Yeah, but this is what you want to understand, right? Yeah. So you want to basically have tests that lock this up. So one of the questions I always want to ask with that team is that if I go to the code and I change the attack surface, do any test fail? Yeah. And if the answer is none, then you have a problem. In fact, you have a problem in development because actually, as a developer, it's actually really nice when the test breaks because it means I connected correctly, right? It means that, hey, you know, again, as a developer, I, I don't want a mode where when I add a new thing, I have to start the application, go to the page, press F5. Oh, I should be able to add an endpoint, write a test, and be comfortable knowing that I did the right thing. I shouldn't have to start the application, 
right, to do that, right? So, so that, that's the thing. So this is a, a, a very good example of, from an attack surface, we want to start to see these mappings, but we, from a threat modeling, every one of these needs to be threat modeled. Well, yeah, because every one But what you find is that there's going to be only three or four patterns here. So just to finish off, the helps could be one of those that has no impact or could bring the server down. Because if the health, so this is a good example, like if the health endpoints does any work, then you can have a problem because you can overload the server by the health, which I actually seen in real world because I've seen servers being brought down because the load balancer keeps hitting the health, right? And actually they brought down internally because the, the and then then you have these sometimes again is the delays the guy sends more right so so the health is a good example of the path the, the, the right pattern for a health system is that the health call should receive receive static data mm -hmm. and then you have another process that updates the static data mm -hmm. to do that but that's a pattern yeah. right so what you then see is again as you do a lot of these you find that you get to recycle a lot of patterns for a lot of different things mm -hmm. right. Right, cool. Well, I think that that's the first pass. That's the first pass, right? Yeah. And, I, and I think what's what's cool about this, right, is to see that I think in threat modeling, right, you know, what I'm trying to promote here is this idea that you know we, we from a security angle, like we we evolve the thinking of the development, right? We we help and we create things that make the developers' life easier, but also allows the developer to understand the side effects of what you're doing, and even more importantly. You know, gives them a very good brief of what they're going to implement. Cool. So we can continue with the rest of the slides at the session of five, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. I think Alana. I think we 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 good. Where are we? Can stop the recording. Yeah. We can. Hello. Yeah. We can. <laughs> you have to.